Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I mean, here we are, it's 2020, and um, things are a little quiet at Concordia. Um, we haven't had any concerts since March of this year, and uh, we're looking for ways to connect with our audiences and continue to uh, spread the word of God uh, through our music ministry. So today, we're having a Reformation 500 watch party. Uh, 2017, three years ago, does seem like uh, quite a long time ago right now, and uh, we look back on, on that year with um, a lot of uh, great memories. Um, we had a tremendous 500-year anniversary celebration at our university that year. Um, it started in March uh, with some uh, events, and it led all the way until November 1st, which was the date of our big concert that we're going to watch some portions of today. I have with you here today um, two of my good friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Steve Mueller, who's the Vice President of the University. He's our Chief Mission Officer and Dean of Christ College. Uh, Dr. Michael Bush, um, the Director of Vocal and Choral Activities at Concordia, Director of the Concordia Choir and the Master Chorale. And I am Jeff Held. I'm Assistant Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, sorry, the School of Arts and Sciences and um, also the director of orchestral activities. So uh, we're here to share a little bit about um, a really big event. Um, I'm gonna ask Steve to say a few words about the Reformation. Sure, uh, the Reformation is not an us versus them event. It was Martin Luther uh, who read the word of God and discovered that his church was not teaching faithfully. They were obscuring the gospel and changes were needed. And we thank God that after 500 years, changes have been made across many Christian churches, reflecting uh, and addressing of some of the issues that Luther raised. Nonetheless, they were critical issues. At the very heart of it, how is a person saved? And Luther discovered in scripture the truth, a person is saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And the Reformation celebrates the day that that all kicked off as Luther called his church to address some of these issues. We remember it today not because of that event so long ago, but because of the truth of the gospel. We're still saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. We're going to hand it off to Dr. Michael Bush to talk about our first musical number. Performing at Sigurdstrom Hall was uh, an incredible uh, moment for, um, for all of us and for our department. Uh, to be in such a grand space for this celebration was truly remarkable. Um, this first piece that we're going to be listening to is a setting of The Church's One Foundation by Dan Forrest. And uh, as a former brass player, trumpet player, one of the things that really gets my heart going are big fanfares. And so uh, we spread brass throughout the balconies in the hall and we're surrounded by tremendous fanfares for this iconic
Reformation 500 celebration was broken up in themes that would help articulate the Reformation and celebrate the great music that came out of it. We started off with a section hymned by saints and angels, and then we turned to a series of summary statements of the Reformation, usually called the solas. Sola scriptura, scripture alone, is the source of our doctrine. Sola gratia, grace alone, is the way we're saved, not by our works. Sola fide, faith alone, is how we receive that gift. We believe, we trust. Solus Christus, Christ alone, underlies all of those. And finally, we ended with the section called Always Reforming, noting that the work of the church to stay firm in Holy Scripture is an ongoing thing. Our music was alternated with written texts that were designed to flesh out those themes. If you're curious about them, you can see them in the concert live stream, or you can pick them up in a book called Always Reforming that's available on Amazon that has all of the meditations for the year. I was actually reading some of that this morning to uh, remind myself of some of the great work that was done for, for the Reformation. Um, I, it's, it's a really wonderful short text, um, some short devotions to read, um, including uh, your wonderful hymn that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I want to say, too, um, I think one of the special things about this uh, program was that um, it was probably the largest gathering of uh, Lutherans in Orange County in the Los Angeles area uh, since I think the 450th anniversary of the Reformation. If I remember right, uh, someone in this room might know, um, I think it was at Anaheim Convention Center they did a big uh, Lutheran rally for that. Uh, maybe someone watching this will, will have been there. Um, but uh, at this maybe, maybe Michael knows. I was a little young when oh, that okay. happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it, it was thrilling, um, honestly, to, to walk on that stage and to see every seat in the 2,000-seat uh, concert hall. Uh, by the way, Segerstrom Concert Hall is uh, it's one of the finest concert halls in the United States. And uh, it... As a fitting setting, um, it works so well because we were able to have 300 singers in there. Um, we had about 250 on stage in front of the audience and another 60 um, in the back of the hall, which was a high school honors choir, which you saw sing a verse on uh, the church's one foundation. Um, and uh, to bring all of those together, the choirs were made up of students from Concordia and uh, many of our local Lutheran churches. And the high school choir was an honors choir uh, selected from four Lutheran high schools in the area. Uh, so this was truly a gathering of our LCMS Lutheran community, and it spread further than that as well as it welcomed so many people in. Um, but it was a joyful time uh, for us to come together. So often we do our work on Sunday mornings, and uh, it's really neat to uh, bring our church uh, community together and to, um, to experience that strength in, in the Lord. Um, it was a great time. Uh, one of the cool things about this program was we were able to um, uh, showcase a lot of the music of the Lutheran tradition. Uh, one of the pieces is the next one we'll listen to, um, and I'll let Michael talk about it a little bit. So we're going to hear the Concordia Choir sing O Day Full of Grace, arranged by F. Melius Christiansen. Christiansen is uh, one of the founders of the Lutheran College choral tradition, and he conducted at St. Olaf during the early 1900s. Part of his work that he has passed down to us are these incredible arrangements of iconic hymns. And in O Day Full of Grace, he deftly uses these musical compositional techniques to paint the words and to tell the story. So at the very beginning, you're going to hear uh, the quiet entrances of voices, one layered on top of another, that almost describe this sense of a, an awaiting dawn over the horizon as creation waits for God's promises to be fulfilled. And as this peace develops and God's grace is revealed through his son, we hear the dancing of creation You'll hear that in uh, the uh, sopranos melodies that are leaping and melody and dancing in rhythm 
until finally the triumphant chords that the choir sings at the end when all of creation is fulfilled in the final days in these uh, triumphant chords where we get to meet him in heaven. Salvation unto us has come is one of the great hymns of the Reformation. In fact, in some traditions, it's the hymn of the day for Reformation Day. Even in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod today, it's that or a mighty fortress or the choices for hymn of the day. It was written in about 1524 by Paul Sparatus, and it was part of the first Lutheran hymn book, a collection of eight hymns that was published. Uh, Luther wrote some, Sparatus wrote the rest. Uh, Fourteen stanzas, and all of it inspired by Romans 8, 28, we maintain that a person is justified by grace through faith apart from works of the law. Sparatus takes that and in a masterful theological exposition. He expounds law and gospel, the purpose of the law in showing our sin and the futility of using it as the means of our salvation. God's gracious providing of a Redeemer in Jesus that provides all that is needed 
Salvation has come to us through Jesus, Christ alone, by God's free grace and favor, grace alone. And later on, he speaks of faith. It really does capture the essence of the Reformation. Our composer selected, I think, six of the 14 stanzas, and he did a good job selecting them. Reformation hymns tended to be a lot longer uh, than our congregations are used to singing today. Uh, but uh, it's a beautiful hymn. I encourage you as you listen to also maybe consider looking up the rest and reading as part of your devotion some of the things Spiratus wrote to help us better understand these themes. Yeah, Jeff, tell us a bit about the setting. Sure, thanks. Um, if you go in your hymnal, there's so many wonderful uh, ways of spending some time in personal reflection. And um, I think you take a hymn like Salvation Unto Us Has Come or... Um, it's kind of partner hymn, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. You will see an exposition of uh, the Lutheran doctrine, the Christian faith. And uh, for many uh, who have grown up singing these hymns, uh, it's easy to hum that hymn in your head or sing it out loud in your room. Uh, it's what a gift these are. Um, for this musical setting, we turn to um, a friend of Concordia's, uh, Robert Hobby. Um, he's the musical director at a church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he's a regular on our cycle of uh, the fall festival of hymns. Uh, he's a favorite. We love it when he comes out and shares many of his newest um, arrangements with us. Um, this one is one that he published for uh, organ and choir. And we adapted it for, uh, instead of using organ stops, uh, reed organ stops, we would um, we put actual double reeds on the music. He wrote a really neat setting that um, is an ode to the Renaissance, the time that this hymn was originally written. Um, you'll hear um, some, uh, some of those sounds. You'll hear um, kind of some dance rhythms, uh, tambourine playing sometimes at one uh, point, we uh, throw it to the back of the hall, and you'll hear the high school choir singing a verse uh, accompanied by woodwinds, including um, a fife um, playing a really um, ornamented solo um, on top of that melody. And uh, just a, a wonderful way to hear the assembly sing. Again, this was an opportunity for us to um, not over-orchestrate the music, but to... Um, allow the hall to sing. It was awesome, wasn't it? We had 2,000 people there and 300 voice choir on top of it. Um, it's really one of my life's greatest memories in hearing um, assemblies sing uh, music. It was tremendous. Um, I also should mention too that one of the middle verses was played by organ alone. It was an organ solo. We asked uh, Dr. Tom Mueller, our university organist, to uh, consider that text and to uh, play an improvisational type of uh, organ verse for it. So you hear some uh, very creative sounds um, as he uh, explores some of the, the sounds of that wonderful Gillespie organ in Segerstrom Concert Hall. Salvation unto us has come.
The next piece that we're going to share with you today is a special setting of Christ Be My Leader. This is a hymn that was written in the 1960s, and it's become one of the most well-known hymns in all of Christendom. Um, it was inspired by John 14, verse 6, uh, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, the first verse of the hymn talks about Christ the way. The second verse, Christ the truth. And the third verse, Christ the life. Um, this particular hymn, I think one of the reasons why it is so popular today is it works very, very well in a lot of different musical styles. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to um, do something a little different at this point in the program. And instead of uh, thinking of big, huge chorus, organ, orchestra settings, we cut this down to um, a small ensemble of strings and two soloists. We asked Steve Young, um, our director of commercial music, to write this setting, and he's a real master at this type of music. And uh, he really, in my opinion, wrote the perfect setting for this point in the program. And um, it has a sense of an Appalachian feel, which is very Americana type of feel. And we utilize two of our excellent student soloists for this. Uh, so Christ be my leader.
was some beautiful music. Next up is one uh, that was commissioned for this concert, Christ Alone, the World Redeemer. Uh, I was uh, asked to write a text for the Reformation, which is no small thing. There are an awful lot of good Reformation hymns out there, to, so to take up this task uh, was a little daunting. Uh, I finally settled on the approach of using a, the common summary for the Reformation, the solas. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. Uh, these are the, the themes that summarize the Reformation. Little known fact, a lot of people think those go all the way back to the beginning, that even maybe Luther came up with them. Uh, the best we can tell is they arose during the 20th century as someone was summing up the Reformation for a new generation. Uh, but everything they say comes straight out of the Reformation era. Now, it's common for most people to talk about the three, scripture, uh, grace, and faith. Uh, Christ is added to it, of course, underlying it all, but often left off because in Latin, it's sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura, but solus Christus, and so it's not quite as poetic, but it was always assumed. This hymn takes each one of those in turn, takes some time exposing what it means biblically, uh, and then adds a final stanza in which I also stretched it a little bit, inspired by Bach, who signed most of his pieces, Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be all the glory. And so those make up the verses of this hymn. When I write a hymn, I've always got a melody in mind, uh, and uh, the idea on this one was that the composer might take that and write a new melody. Uh, somehow, I honestly don't know why I thought of this one, but it, the words seem to fit around uh, in Babylone, the, the tune that we used for the, for the uh, concert, and the composer decided to stick with it. So uh, that's, uh, that's where we ended up with the hymn on the solace. Jeff, why don't you tell us a little about the setting? Well, Steve, first of all, I want to thank you. It's such a wonderful hymn. I, I personally have reflected on the words many times, and uh, my favorite line is, it actually turned out to be the uh, first section of the hymn, the, the concert itself. Uh, we use the same line for it. Um, I think it's uh, one of the key lines in the entire concert. It's when you said, hymned by saints on earth and heaven and angels up above. And uh, when you hear something like that, uh, I think uh, many people uh, think about the saints in heaven above that are close to them. And um, to think about that connection between them and us, um, that's one of the great things that music does. Um, it connects um, people of all times uh, in the faith, uh, in the hope of the Lord. And uh, this, this hymn does such a wonderful job of it. Um, to make this a really, truly Concordia contribution to um, the Lutheran hymn repertoire, we turn to um, a Concordia alumnus, uh, Alex Giebert, uh, is well known to many around here. Uh, Alex uh, graduated from Concordia, um, and he is, um, uh, he's, he comes straight out of the, uh, the wonderful Lutheran education system. Here you have a top-notch composer um, that went to grade school at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Orange, uh, Emmanuel Lutheran School in Orange, and uh, was a longtime member at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Uh, then he went to Orange Lutheran High School. I was very blessed to be his band director and handbell director during those years, some of those years, and then I came over to Concordia. And it was really wonderful that he uh, came here um, and studied as an undergraduate. Alex is now working at St. John's Orange as uh, one of the music directors and the director of handbells, and he continues to direct our concert handbells um, Alex wrote, uh, you know, when we work together, Alex has written many uh, hymn arrangements for us for orchestra and choir. I remember asking him for a few things. I said, um, first of all, Alex, we have a lot of blockbusters on this concert, and we can't have this be this massive, gigantic piece throughout. I said, it needs to start small and build. And you'll hear that. You'll hear kind of this musical metamorphosis, um, starting with some very simple harp chords. Uh, he actually had two harp parts on this. And uh, a beautiful choir verse that he wrote. And it just gradually builds and builds. And once in a while, you'll hear little snippets of brass fanfares that kind of fade off. And then there's this grand um, interlude that um, is broken up 
by what I think was one of the coolest musical effects we had in Segerstrom Hall. Now, if you go to a church with a, um, a large organ, uh, you might hear the organist use uh, a stop called the Zimbelstern. Uh, the Zimbelstern is used um, oftentimes on uh, uh, final hymn verses to add a little festive flair, and it's essentially a mechanical bell tree and um, just adds a, uh, a wonderful, bright sound to the hymn. Well, I don't believe that the uh, Gillespie organ in Segerstrom Hall has a Zimbelstern, and maybe it did. I, I don't exactly remember, but it wasn't loud enough for me. Or I, I don't remember what the deal was. Um, but uh, when I was talking to Alex, I said, you know what? We can do our own Zimbelstern effect. And so we put, um, we put bells all over the hall. The whole 360 degrees effect in the top balconies, we had uh, glockenspiels, crotales, handbells all over. And uh, it was this wonderful, joyful tingling um, that emerged, and it led to this wonderful final verse that uh, Steve uh, wrote for us. And um, to also express um, the human um, outpouring of joy, uh, we brought in a dancer. Uh, we brought in that dancer um, on the words... Um, <clears throat> God is calling to believe. Faith is living, busy, active. And, you know, what better way of showing that than um, to have uh, liturgical dance, which is sometimes used in our church. And it was used to great effect here. So this was one of the central pieces of this great concert. Thank you, Steve, for a wonderful text. Um, Christ alone, the world's redeemer.
Well, we want to thank you for joining us on this uh, wonderful uh, step back into uh, the old days of 2017. Um, we look forward to seeing you again as our audience members uh, in the near future. Uh, we miss you, um, but we're really glad to interact with you today. Uh, we're going to close this uh, watch party uh, with two wonderful pieces, um, Luther's A Mighty Fortress and also his evening prayer. Um, Steve, would you say a few words about the hymn? Sure. Well, A Mighty Fortress is commonly known as the battle hymn of the Reformation. Try to get a Lutheran church to sit down you know, when it's being sung, and you'll see what it means. They all pop to their feet. In fact, at, at my church on Reformation Day in 2017, we had an extended musical introduction, and we told people, stay seated, we'll stand up for the hymn. They wouldn't do it. The organ started playing, they were on their feet, because it's a mighty fortress, we've got to sing out loud. <laughs> And it's always had that character. It's become seen as we're proud of this Reformation and what it represents in our faith and our life. But that's not how it started. 1527, we think, is when Luther wrote this, or somewhere between there and 1529. There's a lot of different theories of what led to it, but the plague was coming. The Reformation was getting difficult. There was persecution and trouble on all sides. And Luther turned to music, picking up Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and turning it into a hymn. Luther wrote the words and the music for this. It's a very rugged text, kind of reflects Luther's personality and the music along with it. And so it was picked up very quickly after that. It was sung in the streets by people. It was said to be sung by people as they went to their deaths. Gustavus Adolphus had some of his troops sing it before they went into battle during the Thirty Years' War. And so it became gradually known, instead of a hymn of comfort, which was the heading that went over it for many years, it gradually transitioned and became called the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. In all of it, Luther's showing his reliance on God. Whatever is going around us, whatever is happening, Christ is the victor. He reigns supreme and he cares for us. And particularly in this year, when things are so challenging, when we face our own plague, when we have our own challenges to deal with that are so frustrating at times, that word of comfort, God is our refuge and strength, means a lot. I hear the hymn a little differently today than I did three years ago. It has a fantastic musical setting. Jeff, tell us about it. Well, I think we all felt a little bit of pressure. Uh, it's the 500th <laughs> anniversary of the Reformation. Um, everybody wants to hear A Mighty Fortress, but which one do we use? <laughs> so, um, you know, in reality, um, we had a long uh, celebration, and we used a lot of A Mighty Fortress. I had to cut a deal with my students. I said, I promise, next year, no orchestral settings of A Mighty Fortress. Because um, um, actually the day before this concert, we had a wonderful on-campus celebration. We had an excellent chapel service where we uh, used a mighty fortress. Bud Bisbee's excellent arrangement that so many people uh, have uh, gotten to know and love. Um, the orchestra performed Mendelssohn's Fifth Symphony, uh, which famously uses Ein Feste Berg, the tune for a mighty fortress in its final movement. And then we come to this concert, and uh, my goodness, we had... Um, uh, of course, we had to use it, and use it in multiple ways. We actually started the concert with um, the way we start many things in Lutheran celebrations, a Bach organ prelude. So uh, Tom Mueller played uh, Bach's, one of Bach's uh, organ preludes on a mighty fortress, and that started our concert. And you, uh, if you came to this watch party early, you would have heard that performance. Um, then it came to, of course, the the finale, the grand finale, so to speak, of our concert. And um, uh, we wanted to um, maybe speak to both sides of a mighty fortress that uh, you just mentioned. And uh, what came to my mind uh, was an old Philadelphia Orchestra album called the Bach Album. Uh, Eugene Ormandy conducted it um, in 1968. And there was a short uh, very simple but beautiful uh, chorale setting featuring the low brass of the Philadelphia Orchestra. 
Um, and it was arranged by Arthur Harris, who's a great arranger for the Philadelphia Orchestra, Boston Pops, all of that. So I thought, that's perfect. You know, I, that's, that's one of the things that we want to use. Um, and so I went to the Arthur Harris uh, Heritage website and looked for that. And a lot of his pieces are accessible uh, for more orchestras today. But Ein Festerberg was not listed. So um, uh, starting to get disappointed, having trouble finding it. But we ended up calling the librarian of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, who was uh, very enthusiastic in helping us. And he went digging. Mm -hmm. And he found the manuscript of this Arthur Harris arrangement. And uh, they very kindly uh, shared this uh, work with us for maybe a $50 processing fee or something like that. And um, not too long after, in my mail, uh, shows up this score with Eugene Ormandy's notes throughout. Wow. And uh, so we got to conduct and play off of that. I thought that was really special to do. And it also was, uh, I thought, the, the perfect prelude to um, the setting that uh, we commissioned as the big, a mighty fortress. Michael, why don't you say a few words about that? So we approached uh, one of the preeminent hymn arrangers of our current day, uh, Dan Forrest. Uh, to uh, arrange this hymn for us. Um, he has this unique gift in being able to uh, highlight certain parts of the text that sometimes are not always remembered or um, are, are glossed over. And he, he makes these words seem brand new to us. And so in this particular setting, one of the uh, really cool things that he does is you hear these anvil strikes, mm -hmm. as if the 95 theses are, um, are being pounded on the uh, church doors uh, by Martin Luther himself. And to begin this setting, he doesn't use a whole choir. He uses a single male voice to sing that, uh, that opening verse. Uh, and then from there, it begins to grow. We had a neat opportunity to um, uh, performed this on our choir tour in Germany to uh, Martin Luther's church. And uh, we weren't prepared for uh, as many people to show up to that concert as did. It was standing room only. And uh, so we didn't have enough programs really to go around, uh, uh, but everyone loved that concert so much. And there's a moment towards the end where the audience is uh, allowed, the congregation is allowed to uh, join the choirs in singing this hymn. And I'll never forget, everyone who gathered joined in on this hymn, but not all, everyone in English. We were in Germany. And so they were singing this from memory uh, in German uh, with uh, tears running down their faces. It was a great moment. Um, as a part of our Reformation celebration that year, we took uh, the Concordia Choir and the Concordia Sinfonietta. That was, I believe, almost 100 musicians. And we had 50 additional people uh, come on the tour. So we had a group of 150. Um, and what a thrill it was to perform that piece in the Schlosskirche in Wittenberg. And um, standing room only. In fact, it was standing room only during our rehearsal. It was just such a tremendous thing and you know I, I have to admit I don't know personal pride excitement um, all of the above but it was pretty awesome to take a standing ovation and Martin Luther's gravestone was right here for me <laughs> um, that was awesome um, what a what a tremendous day that was and in the beautiful acoustics of that church to hear this music resonate um, it was truly thrilling and on that gravestone, etched the mighty fortress is our God. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll say too, um, one of the important things that we do at Concordia is we, we try to bring our students into the meaning of the work that they do. It's not enough to perform great repertoire, great music. Uh, we want them to understand uh, what it is they're sharing. I think um, the final piece of our concert, we, you know, in our Christmas concerts, we often do this as well, where we, we tend to end with a really big number, um, but then we close with a, a soft carol, often silent night. We did the same thing with this Reformation um, concert. I thought it was very fitting to close our, our whole uh, months-long celebration with a simple prayer. 
and we turn to Luther's evening prayer. Um, maybe you can say a couple things about the background of that. Sure. Well, Luther, in his interest of building people in a devotional life that was grounded in the Word of God and centered on Christ, did many things, including writing hymns and a catechism, but he also wrote prayers so that he could give a pattern for people who are wondering, how do I pray? And so he wrote you know, prayers for meals and prayers for uh, the beginning of the day and prayers for the close of the day. And it's a very simple prayer. I think it actually was a lot of really good sense in pairing this with a mighty fortress because really it's the same idea. Let your holy angel be with me. It's, that's probably Christ, the way Luther meant it. Let Christ be with me this night that the evil foe have no power over me. We've confessed our sins. We're ready to lay down. We rest in God's protection. And we go to sleep in faith. Hmm. The... Um the composer of this musical setting is Carl Schock. Um, again, uh, very fitting to use someone like Carl, um, who uh, is uh, in many ways uh, one of the great uh, Lutheran composers that's uh, responsible for this uh, reawakening of uh, the Lutheran musical tradition uh, as a 20th century composer. Um, that year, uh, we gave uh, Dr. Schock an honorary uh, doctorate from Concordia, Irvine, and uh, it was really wonderful to use his work uh, to close it. Uh, he, he wrote a truly beautiful setting um, that we adorned with uh, string accompaniment and a solo oboe. And I'll say this, um, after, his, um, a after the concert, I sent him a video of uh, Luther's evening prayer. And um, it, I think it's, uh, we, we sometimes think of well-known composers like Schock as Oh, another group is doing my piece. How nice, you know. Um, his, his email response to me the next morning, thank you, thank you, thank you, and all the people who made this possible. It is all quite wonderful, but I must tell you that I listened to Luther's evening prayer with tears in my eyes. It was so beautiful and fitting. So that meant a lot to me to hear from uh, Carl, um, who I've gotten to know very well over the past few years. And uh, it's uh, a tremendous finish to this concert. So we're going to play it um, in succession, uh, the two settings of Luther's A Mighty Fortress, followed by the beautiful, serene evening prayer. Thanks so much again for joining us.